We are shifting into general election mode. This is Donald Trump's chance to expand his base, bring in the moderates. But his rhetoric is only getting darker. Doesn't it seem like the exact wrong thing to be doing? Look, uh, Trump's playbook is his playbook. He's not going to be changing the playbook now. Uh, and uh, he believes that it was running uh, with regard to his base and his base alone that somehow got him elected in 2016. He is uh, he governed for four years. He governed this country as the president of Red America uh, and saw himself not as the president of the whole country, but very much as the president only for those who supported him. And I think that's the campaign that we're seeing right now. There are so many echoes of the very first days that uh, Trump was entering national politics, the ranting uh, and the demagoguery about uh, uh, immigrants, for example, the uh, very dark apocalyptic vision, you know, remember American carnage, uh, you know, that was all the way back in 2017. So to me, what's old is new again with with Donald Trump in this campaign. Matt, can rage, hate and promises of vengeance win him this general election? It was five days ago we were talking about Nikki Haley voters and how Donald Trump or Joe Biden can go for them. I'm thinking about all those Haley donors that I know here in New York. They are running from every single thing he has said in the last five days. <laughs> Can he win? Yeah, Donald Trump can win this election. And I would put the odds today at 50-50, whether he wins or not. And the country, pretty much all the voters know kind of who he is and what he says and, uh, you know, the ma the type of person he is and the type of leader he is. And I and I think it's Joe Biden's, it's, up, uh, the, it's incumbent upon Joe Biden is to sort of set the frame of what a Trump presidency would look like. And he's already given us, he's already told us this by praising Biden, by praising Orban, uh, who are autocrats in their country, what it's gonna look like in the course of this. But Donald Trump can win. And and I would I would say that all of this sort of pro Haley, you know, these anti-Trump Republicans, it, it, it's a myth that they represent what the Republican Party has become today. Donald Trump in every single poll right now gets 90% plus of Republican identified voters, 90% plus. He got 94% of Republican voters in 2000. Donald Trump does better among Republicans than Mitt Romney did, than John McCain did, than George W. Bush did in the course of this. And so he's gonna have his base, which is probably 40, 42% of the country right now. And I think that's why Joe Biden has figured out right now this early uh, that he has to run a campaign that basically says this is who Donald Trump is and this is how your life will be affected in a second Donald Trump term. But Matthew, even Donald Trump this weekend going after Joe Biden's stutter, maybe you would have made that argument a week and a half ago, but he nailed the State of the Union address and his stutter is something he has overcome. How is that a win for Trump? <laughs> Well, Donald Trump doesn't ever change his, his direction, as Susan said. He is who he is. And I mean, that's Donald Trump. He won in 2016, making fun of people that with disabilities, saying all kinds of, you know, harsh, cruel, ridiculous things in the course of this. This is Donald Trump is. And anybody that thinks uh, they're going to be able to manage Donald Trump in this process to say or do anything other than who he is. I mean, he's an airplane pilot that doesn't change his flight path, no matter if there's a storm in front of him or it's clear skies or there's a blizzard headed his way. He does what he's going to do, uh, regardless of whatever, what anybody else will tell him the outcome is. Yes, and it won him the election in 2016, and it has been a lose-a-thon for Republicans ever since. Sam, tonight Donald Trump on social media said that one of his first acts in office would be the releasing of the January 6th defendants. Here's what I don't get. He had the chance to pardon all of these people when he was president, and he chose not to. How does it serve him now? Well, to echo everyone else's point, I don't know if he's operating from some straight, great strategic, you know, uh, mindset here. I think he's just sort of guttural and doing what's in his interest and in front of his uh, eyes. And today, or it was yesterday, the House Republicans put out uh, the report on January 6th and, and, and uh, the, the congressional inquiry into it. And I'm guessing Trump saw that and uh, was, you know, inclined to send out this tr post on True Social. But that's sort of his approach, right? It's what's in front of him, and then he takes a whack. Same thing with going after Joe Biden for his stutter. There's nothing, like, large-term strategic about it. 
Um, ultimately, it could serve him well because people view authenticity in it, right? But uh, frankly, uh, I'd say it hinders him uh, in the long run because I think uh, more no most normal voters are going to say, well, why would we want to pardon people who ride it at the Capitol? Or is it right for someone to make fun of someone's stutter? You know, he could expand his coalition uh, in theory, beyond the the forty four percent or whatever Matt talked about, and he will, but he could expand a lot more. He just chooses not to do it. Susan Victor Orban is one of Vladimir Putin's only European allies. Donald Trump welcomed him into his home this weekend. He then went on CNBC and kind of bragged about it. Those people who are listening to that interview, I know they don't like to hear that Joe Biden wants to tax the rich. But are they A-OK with one of Putin's homeboys laughing it up with Trump all weekend? They feel good about that? Look, one of the most striking things, I think, that makes Donald Trump different from, from any president of the United States, Democrat or Republican we've had, is his striking affinity with the world's dictators, strongmen, uh, and sort of bad guys. And Orban has become a sort of a, a celebrated figure of the American far right, as well as the European far right over the last few years. Uh, Trump praised him the other day in remarkable terms for an aspiring president of the United States. He he said basically, well, he uh, is a non-controversial figure in Hungary because he basically doesn't brook any uh, disagreement with his views. And to Donald Trump, that is high praise. Donald Trump has a love affair with Kim Jong-un. He has this admiration for Vladimir Putin. He has admiration for Erdogan in Turkey, for Xi Jinping in, in China. It's, it's one of the most, I think, striking and notable differences between Trump and, and any other president we've ever had in American history. So it's not a surprise that he would be making common cause with Orban the same way he made common cause with uh, Brazil's leader, Bolsonaro, uh, during his 2020 uh, election campaign. This is this is who fundamentally Donald Trump is, and his, it's what he wants to take America to, is a different place. He has all the instincts of a natural authoritarian. Sam and Applebaum pointed out earlier today that because of Trump's let Russia win uh, policy, that is slowly becoming the Republican policy. What does it say that our country's stance on the Russia-Ukraine war seems to be on the ballot in November? Well, it's not just that. I mean, remember, Republicans are negotiating a border bill uh, up until Donald Trump said, don't do it because I want the issue. And then suddenly that was no longer the Republican Party policy. Even right now, uh, a bill to ban or uh, sorry, to make the uh, company that owns TikTok divest from uh, the Chinese government uh, is suddenly up in the air because Trump did a 180 on it. Um, so, you know, this is what happens often uh, when a Republican or Democratic nominee becomes the de facto nominee of their party. But in Trump's case, it's it's remarkable be simply because of how much uh, he pulls the party in his direction. He, today, for instance, you had this back and forth on Social Security. I mean, Trump is atypical in the sense he's always been, or at least tried to present himself, has always been someone who defends entitlement programs. Most Republicans would have, uh, in years ago, said, you know, we want to reform these programs. But Trump has shaped the party uh, to his image. Sometimes it's in weird ways and sometimes it's in authoritarian ways. And it certainly has a huge impact on the geopolitical stage. Matthew, in a new book, CNN's Jim Shooter writes that several of Trump's senior advisors, former advisors, say that he has admired dictators. Susan just laid it out for us. And he even said that Hitler quote, you remember that one that Hitler did some good things? And he told my colleague Joy Reid about the former White House chief of staff reacted to Trump saying that. Watch this. And he had to, in effect, correct Trump's imagined history here, because Trump, in, in saying that Hitler did some good things, he said, well, he rebuilt his economy. And Kelly would say to him, yeah, he rebuilt his economy to go to war with the rest of Europe, including your very own country. And then he said, well, but his generals were loyal to him, unlike my generals, as he liked to say, you, General Kelly, and others. And Kelly had to correct him of that, too, to say, well, actually, in, in fact, Mr. President, Hitler's generals tried to assassinate him. Matthew, how is this not another red flashing light for the Republican Party? Right? We're not going to give any more money to Ukraine. You know what will happen? Russia's not going to stop. They'll be knocking on Poland's door next. We will be in another world war. Why are so many people, even beyond Donald Trump's base, 
seemingly okay with this. It was just a few days ago that Mitch McConnell gave him his endorsement. I mean, unfortunately, there's a large percentage of population of the United States of America who believes in the ends justifies the means. And if they have a strong man or a strong woman uh, on doing what their bidding was and, you know, attacking, really attacking who they don't like, then they're fine throwing democracy away and supporting the strong man. That's, I think, I think that movement in our country is more actually concerning than Donald Trump himself, because that is a movement that exists in our country with or without Donald Trump, that they're willing to accept that in the course of this. And I would just say for any Americans listening who have questions about this, who think that our democracy is just it's guaranteed for the existence, no matter forever how long the United States exists, they fooled themselves. We have the first time in post-World War II in the post-World War II history, a retraction in the number of democracies in the world as a, a, instead of an expansion of the democracies of the world. We've never had that. We have left less democracies today in the world than we did 10 years ago in this. And I, I just remind folks, democracy is a gift. It's not a given. It has to be worked at. And I maybe one of the benefits of Donald Trump uh, in, in the very few that there are, I think, is that it's a reminder that we have to do things that preserve the institution of democracies, the institution of democracy and our freedoms in order to preserve, preserve this constitutional democracy that we have. There are countries in all of our lifetimes that were democracies, Germany being one of them, that became dictatorships, Chile being another one, that were democracies, functional, healthy democracies, that because people supported a strong man, because they wanted him to do certain things they wanted done, threw their democracies away. And that's what my biggest fear, and I hope other Americans' fears are, is that we have to work at this, and we have to work at it today. And I think we've gotten lazy in working at our democracy, and Donald Trump has taken advantage of that laziness.